Welcome to today's session, everyone. We are PreMedCC, a student-led organization established in the fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, our events are open to anyone. We realize that finding guidance and mentorship in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation pre-med students, people that lack the financial resources, or just those who do not know people in the medical field. One of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can do it from the comfort of your own home. We typically have events on Fridays from 5 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and on Saturdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 Pacific Standard Time. If you aren't able to attend the event, all of our sessions are uploaded on our YouTube channel. Many of our sessions will end up with a Q&A with the speaker. Any questions that you have, you may put it in the Q&A session on Zoom, and our team members will read them and have them answer. After you have attended our event, you can log in to our website and complete the quiz, which will contain questions pertaining to our session today. If you score 70% or higher on the quiz, you will be awarded a certificate to show that you attended our session today. If you want to stay connected with our upcoming events or just want to tell your pre-med friends about the pre-med CC, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok as at pre-med CC. All right, everyone, welcome. Uh, we're going to get started and we're going to let each of the speakers introduce themselves. So uh, we will start with Preeti first. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Preeti. I'm a fourth year MD PhD student at Wow Cornell. Um, I'm from California. I grew up in San Jose and I went to undergrad at Caltech in Pasadena. My background is in computer science, and right now I do research um, in computational biology. I'm in the PhD years, and then I'll go back to med school, so I'm going to be in school for a while. Other than that, I mean, I love exploring New York City. I love to sing and dance, and um, I've recently started reading again, which is also really fun. So, yeah, that's me. Um, Sangi, do you want to go next? Hello, my name is Sanjay. Um, I'm a third year medical stu student at Mount Sinai. And I was actually born and raised in South Korea, but I came to, I moved to the States when I was 19 in 2007. And then um, I went to College of Eastern Utah, which is community college actually, and later uh, became part of Utah State University. So I went to the exact same school, but I have two transcripts from College of Eastern Utah and then Utah State University. Then I joined the Army, served for four years in the Army as a medic in Hawaii. Then I got another bachelor degree. Um, well, the first degree was in nursing, and then the, I uh, went to Hunter College in New York City for second degree in biology. And after that, I went to um, Mount Sinai, and I'm third year there. Um, Aaron, do you want to go next? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Aaron. I'm currently a med student at Boston University in Boston. Um, I'm actually between my third and fourth year. I'm on the research year. Um, I grew up in New York. Um, in college, I studied bio and computer science. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. One more thing. Um, I've had a more like traditional, very straightforward path into medicine. So I didn't take a gap year and I applied straight out of um, college. And then George, you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is George. I uh, grew up, I was born and raised in Hawaii, moved to LA to do my undergraduate training at USC. I got a BA in Spanish and a BS in human evolutionary biology. Um, I became really interested in health policy and, and, and political activism. So I did that for a year, um, during which I applied and then, um, started medical school in 
uh, at, at Cornell. So. All righty. So um, you guys that are in attendance, you guys can type your questions in the Q&A and we'll ask our panelists. Um, I want to start first with uh, Sangeet. You said that you are a veteran. Do you feel that as a veteran, when you're applying, were you at a disadvantage? Um, but also you had another career as well. And so uh, did you feel that you had to like prove why you had to, you know, so from both being a nurse and a veteran, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, uh, no, I don't uh, feel I was disadvantaged at all. Actually, medical school uh, really liked non-traditional students with a lot of, it, um, you know, um, experiences um, that are unique. So uh, a lot of med schools actually took interest in uh, my application. Um, so during the interviews, um, a lot of um, you know questions about my nursing career and my army career came up, and you know, a lot of interviews uh, interviewers liked my answers and my unique experiences. So I think that really helped me. Um, I wouldn't say for medical school, but it really helped me uh, become well-rounded person just having a lot of experiences in not like in academic or not in medicine specifically. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think it really helped me. Um, the only downside is like, you know, I, it took four years for me to get a nursing degree and I was serving in the army for four years, so eight years. Um, I mean, would I been able to get in medical school and become a successful medical student without those experiences? I think so. Um, but at the same time, it really helped me become well-rounded um, in many areas. And it re really helped me with the medical school application. Process. Would it be all right if I add to that um, with my own experience, of course? Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I actually didn't mention during my intro. I'm sorry, I'm a little, I got a little nervous. Uh, between my you know, years in undergrad, I got a degree in computer science from Caltech. And then before that, and when I started, the MD PhD program, I actually spent a year working as a software engineer at Salesforce. And um, I agree completely with what you said previously, uh, that having experience in something that's not medicine, having what I call like a real world job and uh, working in industry or working anywhere else and getting that experience, I think is invaluable just because I think if you, for a lot of people, I, I feel like if you stay in school for a really long time, it's kind of hard to realize that there are other things that are more important than the grades that you get in school and the things that are going to happen, you know, the things that you're working towards. And it's, I think, really important to get that real world experience to work with people who are in a different field and to get that perspective and basically see different priorities that people have. I think it was very useful to do something else for that year for that reason. Um, my my path also was pretty non-traditional in that sense. And while things are changing now, because I think in medicine, they're starting to understand the value of technology and computation, and especially things like artificial intelligence, machine learning. I think um, I'm hopeful for people who are applying from, for, from a computer science background now. It was a lot harder when I was applying, I will admit, but um, I, wouldn't re I, would, I don't regret anything. I wouldn't change anything about what I did. So if people have questions about that sort of thing or applying from a major that's maybe less typical, then I'm happy to answer questions about that. Uh, another question that came up was, how can we learn more about health policy as a medical student or in our gap year if we have no prior experience? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to go about doing it. You know, first and foremost, I would just say, get involved wherever you can, however you can. Um, so, you know, there's always some kind of campaign, there's always some kind of candidate that needs help and they have nearby offices, whatever whatever district you live in, I think that's one way to do it. Um, and that'll give you the grassroots side. Um, you can also look at the um, local levels, state levels, and even the national levels to see what kinds of internships are available. A lot of schools have partnerships so that they'll, they'll send students to do internships in Congress, internships with the mayor's office, um, and also another way that I think is really interesting is research. You know, people talk about having to do research for pre-med <clears throat> and it's often like talked about in the biological sense, but there's a lot of um, 
you know, research opportunities that look at health policy, um, which I think will also make your story really interesting. Um, if you need help, like Jubin, I assume you'll give my email out after the session, but, you know, reach out to me. We can also talk further, but I think those are the ways to kind of, kind of get your feet wet. Um, and then you kind of grow into that more and more. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I, I would just say that I spent a little bit of time doing health, you know, health policy work and I did lobbying mostly. It's just getting involved, like literally like going, um, going and knocking on doors. And if you have a local politician, um, if you're savvy with social media and stuff, like all of these politicians need people to manage their social media accounts. And so, um, yeah, so. So yeah, it's just getting involved. It's uh, it's not a class or secret handshake or anything. You just have to get involved. Yeah. Also, I will say the experience of being on the grassroots side or at the lobbying um, table. We used to go every month to Diane Feinstein's office um, or Kamala Harris's office when she was senator. Um, is very different from you know working as one of their fellows. Um, and so being able to contrast both, being able to look at how. Um, you know, patients coming in, what, what are the problems that are facing their community, community? How are they advocating for it? And then being on the other side, how are you receiving it? What are you able to do with it? What are, you know, the legislative measures that can be done to um, look at these problems? I think that's a really good way of getting a well-rounded view of health policy. Uh, the next question that came up was about MD, PhD programs and asking if the amount of clinical experience you had prior to applying to medical school was less than the MD student because you were also doing research. Um, I don't know how much experience I had clinically compared to people who are applying MD. Um, just for context, uh, George, how much shadowing would you say you'd done before you applied? Shadowing? I... I had quite a bit. I had, I think, 400 hours, um, but I don't think you need that much either. Um, no, I'm, I'm sure you don't. Um, yeah. So uh, when so I believe in the application process, when you apply MD, there's one question that you have to answer, which is why do you want to be a doctor? And it's a lot easier to answer that question when you've actually been in the hospital and seen doctors do their thing. Uh, when you apply MD, PhD, there are actually three questions you have to answer. So one of them, again, is why do you want to be a doctor? The second one is, why do you want to be an MD, PhD and not just an MD or just a PhD? You'll also be asked that in all your interviews. And then th the third question is about your research experience. So I, I think for me, I had enough shadowing experience where I was able to write about one of those experiences for my why do you want to be a doctor essay, where and if we're just going by a word count, I want to say the the word count for or the character count for the why do you want to be a doctor essay is like 3000 and for significant research experience it's actually like 10000 characters so my guess is that research experience is probably a little bit more important for md phd programs so if you end up shadowing less because you're doing research i'm i'm sure that's okay uh, because especially during a lot of your interviews you're going to be asked about your research a lot and they're also because because people usually go into the same field that they already have research in, in their PhD. So if you have to pick for like a summer experience between shadowing and research, I would definitely do research, especially since research is hard to pick up and it's hard to get used to. That said, don't not shadow at all. So have enough to the, have enough experience that you can talk about it. But I don't remember many schools asking me exactly how many hours did you shadow? I can't imagine most people care too much about that. Does that answer your question? I think also, I just want to add on to that. Um, I think really with the shadowing clinical experience, that's more of really a, a marathon thing, the way you kind of accumulate. Um, you know, everyone's going through a different situation, of course, but, you know, if you do like two hours a week or do some program where you kind of do it little by little, um, I think that'll accumulate rapidly, but you're still able to kind of carve out time for it, even though you're busy with classes, trying to do more research, et cetera. Um, there are a lot of programs that have that kind of structure. I did personally the UCLA um, Care Center Fellowship, or I don't know what's called it now, but it's a four hour thing per week. And I would do that. And that was, you know, more than enough time to devote to kind of just devote to clinical shadowing per week. And I still was able to, you know, stay on top of everything else. And so I would really recommend finding some kind of way to make it more of a balance and not like um, concentrate it all in like six months or something. 
Yeah. Um, so I was asked to talk a bit about the research I did in undergrad. So I've actually I spent all my summers. So though I went to Caltech, I actually did all my research at Stanford. I knew I wanted to go to medical school, even though I studied computer science and I wanted to work in a lab that actually did medical research. So I worked at the Clark lab at Stanford. Um, Michael Clark is the person who discovered stem cells and solid tumors. And so I spent a few summers doing wet lab research with um, with cancer tissue. So one project that I did involved investigating the role of a transcription factor called ELF5. Uh, another one was about um, a, a protein that was overexpressed in Down syndrome that somehow prevented people in Down syndrome from getting cancer. So we were looking into that. And then my senior year of college, that was when I discovered that computational biology was actually a thing. And I realized because my hands were very much not made for pipetting, I was told by my mentor that they actually had a large data set and that they needed help analyzing it. So that was where I, that was my foray into computational biology. And uh, that was the project that became my senior thesis in undergrad, got an award for the thesis I wrote. And um, yeah, there was no looking back after that. I do computational biology now, absolutely love it. Um, and the nice thing about being in that lab was because it was a medical research lab, I was able to actually shadow one of my mentors. So um, I never got to shadow Dr. Clark, but one of the postdocs in the lab was also an MD PhD. And so I shadowed him actually for one summer. And uh, when we weren't, because I, because I was also helping him with his research, whenever he had his clinic days, I would go into clinic with him and shadow him. So actually like research might be for some, in some cases, a pathway to shadowing opportunities. So might be something to consider. Uh, the next few questions are about clinical experience. So um, talking about shadowing experience and then some other options like being certified as an EMT or CNA um, and then other clinical experience besides shadowing. We get these questions a lot of like what you guys did, like how to get involved sort of along that path. Yeah, I think Preeti, you brought up a great point. Research can often be a great way to start shadowing. Um, the one doctor or practice I used to shadow a lot at was because um, my grad student who was doing a master's also applying into medical school you know I came up and I said I don't know anybody what do you do and he said well I know somebody and he brought me in and I was able to get shadowing hours at a neurology clinic uh, which was also you know really amazing opportunity I think part of getting these opportunities is in the same way that you kind of have to <clears throat> be aggressive with getting research opportunities. You will email a lot of people. You can't be scared. Um, you're probably going to have to do a lot of that as well, um, whether it's emailing doctors, um, really being strategic about looking at what kinds of applications to different programs are available when they're due. If you need a letter of recommendation, okay, get that before it's due. Um, there are definitely out there. It's definitely hard to get, especially as a undergraduate student, but I think, you know, talking to us, some people who've gone through it before, I think all of those are ways that you can easily, easily get enough clinical hours for your application. Um, I could also add to this. So the way that I found my shadowing opportunities was I literally just cold emailed like 15 people. Um, and I just said, hey, you know, I'm a student. Um, this is like why I'm really interested in shadowing you. Please let me know if it works out. A lot of people don't respond because a lot of people are very busy, but you only really need one person to say yes to be able to build a relationship. And if you're able to meet them in person, you can probably say, I really love spending time with you. If you have any other colleagues, that would be open. And so once you get your foot in the door, I think it's a lot easier. Um, I think some ways to improve your chances of getting responses from cold emails would be if your school has an affiliated medical school or if there's a medical school that's like in your area, you can say, hey, I'm a local student in the area, would really love to um, get to know you. If any of your professors have medical degrees, you could ask them if they know of any colleagues. So I think cold emailing was really the way to go. I did work as an EMT and I just, it's really busy being in school, um, especially if you have other commitments like research. I think the whole certification process and working as an EMT, I wouldn't say 
I don't know. I think there's, it depends on what you want to prioritize. Um, definitely getting a degree is not the only way to gain clinical exposure. And the whole point of the clinical exposure question, I think in the app, is to make sure that you've truly given thought about this. You know, you've had some experience working in the medical field. It's not so much a question of like, how much do you already know about medicine? Because that's really what medical school is supposed to teach you. Yeah. Um, yeah, completely agree with everything, like the, everything that you just said, actually. Um, yeah, I think I think the purpose of the, the reason they care about clinical experience is that they want to know that you've actually been in a hospital and seen medicine in action, because that's the really, really the only way of knowing whether or not you actually will enjoy medical school. Uh, the other tiny bit of advice I wanted to give is maybe also just think about the people you know, because you might know someone who is a doctor, or you might know someone who knows someone who is a doctor. Like if you just look within your own network, you might be surprised at the connections that you have. So I, I know I have a friend of mine who actually, I think she she didn't really know where to go for clinical experience, but then she found out that one of her family friends was a doctor or knew someone who was a doctor at Stanford or something. And that's how she got her shadowing experience. So you'll be very surprised who you know. I, I yeah, I'll, I'll put it. I'll go ahead, Chief. Sorry. I put, no, I just put this link in there. We did like a two hour and 15 minute talk about all the ways you could get clinical experience. There's a lot of ways you could do this. I mean, one of the examples is, and I know, um, um, and I know that uh, 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 Sun, Sun Jay would admit, but it's like getting getting your CPR license certificate and going and working as a patient escort or a lift team. That's like the easiest way to get into a hospital. If you can lift 50 pounds and you can get in and then you have this whole wider range of you get anywhere in the hospital and, you know, run into doctors and other things. But the other thing is you have to understand if you're an EMT and somebody's paying you for a job, you have responsibilities. They don't really care that if you have to study for an OCHEM exam or that you have other things coming up, you have to show up to work. And so that's um, and so they're not very forgiving in a sense. And so you just have to prioritize what's important to you if being a research assistant is more important or being an EMT or CNA. So you have to choose what's important to you and what you what you want to experience. Yeah, and if I can add a little bit more, um, for me as a, you know, nurses, pers in a nurse's perspective, because I had a lot of patient interaction as a nurse and as actually in the army as a medic, um, my personal statement and my interviews, you know, um, I, I could talk about a lot of patient interactions and like cases that I had and things that I've done for the patients and things that I've done for um, cases and the care teams. So that was really effective uh, in terms of like the admission offices, committees is seeing what kind of things I would do, what kind of uh, capability I have in a clinical setting. So um, I think it's really important. I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessary. You have to go out and work as EMT or CNA, but I think it'd be, if you're interested in it, it'd be nice to maybe like work in it if you're planning on taking a gap year um, because you know, in shadowing, you see things. So in a personal statement, in the interviews, you're going to be like, oh, I saw so-and-so did this and did that. Or I saw patients say this and say that. But instead, if you were working in a clinical setting, you know, a little bit, you're going to be saying, oh, patient told me this. I told the patient this. I did this for the patient or the care team and things like that. And that's, I think that had, there's a huge difference between seeing and doing also, someone's ask, asking, um, does volunteering at a hospital count as clinical experience? And absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, more than shadowing, that experience was kind of what really fortified the notion like, oh, my God, this is what I want to do. Um, and for several reasons, I was way more involved at the hospital volunteering. And, and I think part of it is when you go to be a hospital volunteer, um, yes, know you, what your responsibilities, but also work with everyone, you know, whether it's um, helping the secretary at the front desk. Um, coordinate everything, whether it's offering your help to the CNAs or to the nurses, um, you know, offering to feed the patients when they ask for help, um, being willing to change beds with them, you know, I think I was integrated as a part of a team, 
I learned what it was like to work with, you know, other members in the wards. And, and that, that to me was the experience where I was like, wow, this is, this is how, this is something that I think I can do. Um, if it means I can collaborate with so many people and you get to really work on those skills. So uh, absolutely. I was also going to say something. I know that I'm not exactly like on the panel, but what Aaron said about cold emailing people, um, I was looking for a research opportunity at the beginning of last year. And I think I emailed close to 20 professors uh, for their research labs. And only one person got back to me, but that has turned into like a summer research project and a fourth year research project and like possible publications helping out with some pretty crazy like studies and stuff. So like Aaron said, it only takes one person to say yes. And you kind of just have to put yourself out there with the emailing because the worst they're going to say is no. And honestly, you might not even get a no. You just, you just get a no response. So you kind of just make up the no for yourself. But if you're going to just email and you'll get an answer. Yeah, and if you're in a smaller setting, in a smaller community, actually, if you watch that video, there's like this whole thing of going to actual clinics, like smaller clinics and practices. Um, and that's another way that you could, you know, you drop off a letter and your mm -hmm. <laughs> resume. That's another way to do this. It also depends, like um, older physicians are less on email than younger physicians now. You know what is old and what is young. I mean, I know thirty-year-olds that don't check their emails, and and I know seventy-five-year-olds that check their emails like, you know, like there's no tomorrow. And so, but if you're like in a smaller community, there's a lot of clinics around that you could go to and visit, and the emails may not be either accessible or they may just not check their emails. Yeah. Also, the theme, though, I think, um, you know being proactive is probably what's going to make you the best pre-med student you can probably be, you know, being okay with like, okay, if I hear no, whatever, um, so that you're willing to reach out for any opportunity, even when you don't know it exists, being able to just go up to someone and say, I want to learn from you. I think that'll take you and open um, so many more doors than if you, if you kind of passively waited for things to come your way. So that's a great, great skill to, to develop now. Um, I want to make one point about cold emailing people. Um, <laughs> just so like if you send out 20, you'll probably hear back from one or two. And maybe that might sound discouraging, but I do want to emphasize that the people who you want to work with are the people who are responsive to emails. Because what you want from them is someone who will actually teach you something when you go shadow, possibly someone who will write a letter for you, someone who will advocate for you. You don't want that person to be the person who never checks their emails and you have to email them like four or five times. You have to call them to get that. You want them to be the person who is very responsive, is very supportive. So if they don't email you back, you like filtered out potential mentors. So you should only really consider the people who are very responsive over emails. So it's like totally normal to get ignored. Like even as a med student, <laughs> <laughs> as a resident you'll get ignored i'm sorry <laughs> people are just very busy um it's not a personal thing people just get very busy no that was that was very well said um i i agree actually i, I like the way i chose my first uh the, the way i chose my research mentor for my phd was that there were i think two labs that i was really interested in and one of the professors responded to my email and the other one didn't. And so that kind of made all the difference for me. So yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, I actually, uh, I saw one question. I don't know if it actually got answered, but the question was like, what do you, what do we have to do to become a top? Yeah, what are your few personal top recommendations that would increase the quality of an applicant? Um, did we answer that question, first of all? I don't no, so. I think I cleared that by accident. Okay, no worries. Um, so I, I saw that, and uh, the reason I wanted to respond was, I okay, I I know I know people are going to react uh, maybe strongly to what I'm about to say, and I promise I I've been I mean I've, we've all been in your shoes. We know what it was like to apply to med school. I would argue that applying to med school was worse than being in med school. But the thing that I would go back and tell myself, and what I'm going to tell all of you is, please don't worry about trying to make yourself the best possible applicant. Like you're in college you're in your, you know, late teens, early twenties, I would just focus on doing what you're passionate about and doing what makes you happy. Like 
if I had thought about making myself a top candidate for an, like for any sort of med school or MD PhD program, there's no way I would have majored in computer science because my GPA would have, it, it, it got tanked. So my, my GPA was not very high given like, because I was, I picked a really difficult major and if I'd done something, because for med school, you can major in whatever you want. And I could have maybe picked an easier major knowing that it would be easier for me to get a higher GPA and go to med school. But I really wanted to be a computer scientist. I've been interested in computer science my entire life. I knew I wanted to do research in it. And so I just decided, I don't care what my GPA is going to be. I'm just going to do computer science. I want to get good at it. And you know what, in the end, at the end of the day, if I don't get into med school, at least I'll still have a job. So that was the mentality I took. And somehow, like, I got very lucky. Things did work out. I did end up getting into med school. But I feel like, especially since you don't really, a lot of people, when they get to med school, they realize that they don't like it. And so you don't want to spend your 20s or maybe 30s regretting not having experiences during your undergrad because you were so focused on getting into med school. So pick if you want to do research if you want to shadow pick fields that you're really interested in pick a major you're really interested in pursue your hobbies pursue your passions and i promise things will work out and you'll be a lot happier that's that's all i just wanted to make that very clear uh, other panelists i don't know if you feel similarly but i want to i want to piggyback off of that Preeti. i think i think following your heart is kind of how you became become top and of course you know top should be something that you're being your best self every day don't compare yourself to anyone else um but you know I I initially I was miseducated and I thought oh I want to get a prestigious sounding major so I started as biomedical engineering um and I was pretty miserable and they said oh my god you're you're gonna have to give up your Spanish double major and everything and I said well but my true love is Spanish um and so I dropped the engineering I did Spanish I loved it so much. I excelled in it. I took classes that I think gave me perspective I wouldn't have been able to get otherwise, but served me well applying into medical school and, um, you know, working with patients. And then also, you know, when it came to my research, I was miserable in a more prestigious lab. I thought medical schools wanted to do see more biology and I was doing stem cell research, but I was like, wow, this sucks. Um, and not to say anything bad about the research experience. I just did not like, you know, whatever the ad experience was. And, and my Spanish uh, mentor was like, you know, you're good at Spanish. You want to go to med school. Why don't we just do your, why don't you make your research career on language barriers? And, and, and I, so we did that. Um, and then I, I gave up um, that, that lab job to do what I really wanted to do. And alongside at the same time, I did more of the policy work and I, I had, you know, the best time of my life. And because of how happy I was doing it, you know, I think things start to fall into place. So I think that was really good advice, Preeti. Yeah, yeah, no, I thank you. And I, I agree. Like, I love what you said, too. And I actually have a similar story. So um, I remember when I came to interview at Cornell, I was surrounded by a lot of applicants who maybe took a more typical path, people who had majored in things like biology, chemistry. They were all talking about their research. I had no idea what they were talking about because I'm not a biologist. And I was sitting in this interview feeling very, very inadequate. And then I remember I was at one of the dinners and one of the students was talking to me about um, one of the current students who was applying for residency. She was telling me about all the places that she had to fly to because this was, you know, before COVID, all the places she had to fly to for interviews. And she was saying, you know, I had to go to Boston and then I had to fly to San Francisco. Then I had to come back to New York for an interview. Then I had to go to L.A. You know, I had to do a lot of traveling in one week and it was like really expensive. And um, I then I asked, like, why don't they just write an algorithm to come up with a path that would minimize your travel? And then someone at the table goes, oh, no, but that's a problem for a computer scientist. And I go, oh, wait, I'm a computer scientist. And this was something that I had a perspective and an ability to solve that maybe people at my table and maybe the other interview interviewers, interviewees didn't get to have. So regardless of what you do, whatever your path is, you will have a unique, like a unique experience and a unique perspective. And the more diversity we have in thinking and medicine, the more strong of a field it's going to be. So Another reason why, like, I think pursuing your passion will make you a top candidate, like George said, would like, because you're like, whatever you go through, it'll be invaluable to your experience and what you can bring to the table. Yeah. And I think one of the things, if you learn anything from this talk, besides pretty, like she majored something that most pre-meds don't, but she has a niche in what she's doing and she's very different from everyone else. And, um, different is all, always a good thing. Um, 
because she has a niche that nobody else around her does. And obviously, you know, um, she's, you know, she was doing research, you know, 600 miles away from her school. And so, um, yeah, and so, I mean, but I think you got to do what you love doing. I mean, if being, um, I don't know, chemistry major is torture, be something else like, you know, or if, you know, biomedical engineering is torture, do something else. I, I also just to negate the notion that you have to be a biology major. If you love it, do it. Fine. Um, go to Cornell's website on the admitted students' profiles, and, and you'll see how many people major in outside of sciences. Even, um, and I think it'll give you a good testament as to how we're looking for you know at all medical schools a diverse perspectives. Um, and biology is more traditional, and you know it's not something that we really. It's essential. So, uh, one question was uh, just your opinion on like Cornell, the schools that you attend, like a pro and a con, and why you chose that school. Uh, George, do you want to take this one, or should I answer it first? Uh, I can I can go, um, and go then you can add, add on the MD PhD kind of things. I I think. So I, I applied to five medical schools and Cornell basically saved my life because I got into one school, which was Cornell. I didn't have a choice in terms of, oh, where do I compare? How do I do this? It was you got into one school and it happened to be Cornell. Um, and I've loved it. You know, I, I really got lucky. Um, the year I we matriculated, they decided to induce a um, debt-free program. And that's given me a huge financial relief. Um, I've basically gone to medical school by paying almost nothing um, the next four years, and I've been able to focus on, you know, doing what I really wanted to do. I think Cornell has been a very formative atmosphere, at least in the preclinical curriculum. It's, um, we have weekly tests, and I appreciated that instead of having a large finals, um, you just pass each cumulatively, cumulatively, cumulatively each block at an average of 65 on each quiz, and you're onto the next block. If you um, fail a unit, you remediate with an open book test. Um, and it was meant to really emphasize, you know, your learning and, and take charge of that. And I found, found that to be fantastic. Um, Cornell also had um, great clinical partners in Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, HSS, uh, Rockefeller. And through all of these partnerships, I've, I've, I've had you know, just so many mentor mentors in um, all these institutions. And I think it's been a wonderful experience, um, you know, especially uh, being able to factor in the fact that I got to live in New York City and I got to see patients from all walks of life because I'm in such a big multi-ethnic diverse city. So, you know, I I, I really like the experience here. Um, and I think it's a, it's a blessing to really be here. Yeah, um, I had the same preclinical experience that George did, so I won't talk about that, but... Um... When I was interviewing, I uh, was um, so the thing. So I was pretty much sold on Cornell the minute I interviewed here. It was my first interview, and um, the thing that first of all made me realize that at least so the interview is different. It's a separate interview for MDs versus MD PhDs. But in the MD PhD interview, when the program director at the time was giving his introductory talk about the program and its history to us, he had one slide in the end that very beautifully said. These are the three days we're interviewing. This is the week we're making decisions. This is the day you'll find out whether or not you got in. And when you apply, you'll find that a lot of schools will pretty much ghost you. They'll do like a silent rejection or they'll send you an email like in June after all the acceptances are already in that, sorry, you didn't get in. So the fact that Cornell had made it clear that they weren't gonna make me wait, that they were just gonna say on this day in December, which is very early, whether or not I'd gotten in, I just realized that this was a school that would sort of take care of me and that they wouldn't leave me hanging in stressful situations. And so that was a big part of why I chose Cornell. I also really liked the students. I thought people were very passionate about the fields of research they were in and they were very passionate about medicine in general. I didn't get that sense from the other schools I interviewed and like students were more interested in you know, the things that they did outside of school, which is also fine, but I wanted to go to a place where people were actually interested in the science and the medicine. So uh, that was why I picked Cornell. 
Maybe um, Sung, Sung Chi and Aaron, if you guys want to talk about Sinai and, and B respectively. Otherwise we can we can circle. um I could talk about BU, but um the other general thing I wanted to point out about choosing specific medical schools, and I think this advice I'm realizing now, and um people didn't really talk about it when I was interviewing, was um it kind of I think you should try to think about like what you want more in the future beyond medical school. And I that's I, that's so hard as an undergrad or, you know, pre-med trying to decide, but there's unfortunately, like, for example, California, Texas, very regionally specific schools. If you don't go to a, um, like, Texas medical school, if you don't go to a Texas, uh, California medical school, it's really hard to match into a residency there. Not impossible, but it just is the fact that they very preferentially, like, pick those people over others. Big one is also like Washington, um, the Midwest, they're also kind of like that. They want to show commitment to the people in their area. So that's something you should really consider. The other thing is specialty wise, um, I'm realizing this now that I'm applying to residency. Sp certain medical schools don't have um, residency programs attached to their school. So for example, something like family medicine, most places will have it. But let's say something like ENT, which is a smaller field, not all programs will have an associated ENT residency program. And having a home program is like a safety net because you know they'll advocate for you. But a lot of times the school will, you know, try to like ensure that all of their students match. It's really hard, like applying into ENT, let's say, if you don't have an ENT home program. And perhaps this is very early on, but I think this is something that people don't talk about that I wish helped me inform my decision about where I would want to go. But otherwise from that rant, um, BU is, it's been, um, I think they're go undergoing a lot of changes um, that I personally haven't experienced, but I know that, for example, they're transitioning to more of a 1.5 year preclinical model whereas I did the two years. So it's really hard for me to say what your experience will be like as a student. Um, but clinical training wise, we get really strong clinical training. And that's something that has been mentioned by like a lot of residency directors and even people who as attendings are trying to find jobs because BMC is a safety net hospital. So you will see like all of the very obscure diseases at the late stage term, which is very hard to see in like, big cities usually um, because, you know, people are more preventative with their care. We see a lot of like tropical diseases that come, people from like South America. Um, and because we are a safety net hospital, a lot of psychiatric issues, a lot of drug problems. So in terms of dealing with patients, yes, we see a lot of very challenging patients, but as a student, I feel like I've gotten very, very strong training. And that's something that I really appreciate about BU. That's really awesome. Um, for Mount Sinai, uh, one thing I can say is, I mean, BU, Cornell, amazing school, but I love Mount Sinai uh, because we have amazing research facility, research programs, um, sky's the limit. We have a lot of research teams. Um, at the same time, uh, we do have a lot of hospitals throughout New York City. So as a <clears throat> medical student, you get to your third and fourth year, you do clerkship. And we get to go to the main hospital, like East of Harlem, and we have hospitals. We rotate through Amherst and Queens and um, Beth Israel, Midtown Manhattan and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, one thing about New York City, like each neighborhood is a very distinct. So one rotation, you'll be speaking Spanish the whole time. And then another rotation, you'll be, you know, taking care of uh, patients that speak just uh, Mandarin and things like that. So, and then the, if you go to the main hospital, they're like a VIP floor where, you know, the floors are granite and they're like, I don't know, really expensive paintings everywhere. So you get to see a lot of like um, different uh, patient populations and you work with them and, and get to see what kind of uh, population you want to serve as a physician when you graduate and where uh, you, you can kind of like see a lot of um, different communities and get to uh, take care of them. So that's what I like about Mount Sinai. I just want to say one thing about going back to choosing medical school, guys. Um, 
apply broadly. I can't say that enough. And uh, it's great to have dream programs. Definitely look into what you know speaks to you, where you want to go. Um, but apply broadly because it's really a crapshoot and you don't know where you're going to interview. You don't know where you're, going to, where you're going to get in. If you have a choice at the end, great. If you don't, you know, you get to make that decision afterwards. But, um, you know, if it, I, if, if it were up to me, I would have loved to. My dream was to stay in SoCal because, you know, that's what I had grown used to and everything. And it didn't work that way. Um, and you, and if you you just can't shut yourself off to not getting enough interviews and not getting accepted um, when the. Op other option is to just go, you know, say, go safe and, and kind of have more opportunities if you can. Um, and there are a lot of programs that can help offset that cost as well, especially if you qualify um, with the AMC. So consider that as well. Yeah, uh, that is so true because I got acceptance offers from University of Nevada, Reno. I got acceptance offer from LSU, Louisiana State University and um, University of Colorado. So like I got accepted offers from states that I haven't even been to. So, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, if you don't have any affiliation with that state, don't apply to that state school. Um, they're not gonna even look at your uh, application. That's not true. I applied, I applied broadly. I'm not gonna talk, give you a specific number of application that I submitted, but I applied broadly. And, you know, I had a really positive uh, responses from schools that I have a zero affiliation with and like areas where I never been to in my life. So yes, Georgie's is right. Just apply broadly. Um, I see one question uh, that I'll just answer quickly. Um, it, the question is how important are the number of hours for research experience? Need, like how, how important is the number of hours of research for applying MD PhD? Um, I wouldn't quantify it a number of hours, but I do know that a lot of people in my program actually have definitely at least one year of research experience. Um, a, a, a few people actually like worked as lab techs at various pro parts of like one of one girl in my cohort. She spent three years as, as a lab tech for MSK, and now she like obviously she's an MD PhD in my program. A lot of people take entire years after undergrad to do research before applying MD PhD. So I really can't stress the importance of research experience enough. I would not count it by hours. I would say like quality versus quantity. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for putting it so eloquently. Um, you're going to be expected to describe the projects in detail and they want to know that you actually did them. So I would say I would say you'd need to work on at least three different projects. Yes. But that's not that's a number based on my own estimation. I'm sure a pre-med advisor or someone would have a more accurate number, but I would say at least a year of research experience is needed. Yeah, I'm not I'm not MD PhD, but um, you know, to kind of go off that, um, you know, when you know you've done enough research is when you can look yourself in the mirror and be proud of, you know, the honest effort you've put in and say, wow, I really gave this my all. When you can talk about each step of your protocol, why you do it, and be able to communicate that to whoever's gonna ask you about it, I think. Those are the three things that, you know, that's when I was like, okay, wow, I think I've, I've gotten a good experience. Um, and for some projects like animal-based projects, it might take a little more work. Sometimes it's, you know, more computational. You can kind of do a little bit from that, a little bit of that from home. Um, so it really varies based on, you know, how much you, you, you feel like you're getting out of it. Um, and by the end of it, you should feel like, okay, I've changed because now I can kind of think more scientifically and reason through this kind of situ situation and you, you're able to apply it to the rest of your life. So um, those were my takeaways. Yeah, and the quality comes down to the people that you've done research with because they're going to write a letter for you. And that's going to weigh heavily in saying, uh, like, for example, uh, Preeti was an important team member and contributed uh, immensely in creating this protocol and yada, yada, yada. Or they could say, yeah, George was the <laughs> research person in my lab and he showed up whenever he wanted to. He always had an excuse when something was due. Um, you know, we don't think he was really serious, but yeah, we're just writing a letter. So, I mean, that's, you know, the people, you know, those, those letters, that's why they matter because they validate the work that you've done more than anything. Uh, and, you know, and if you're someone who's just counting the hours, then, you know, they could say, you know, George was in our lab and was just counting, you know, when the paint would chip off the walls and that's pretty much that's all he did so uh versus being an intricate part of the of the team 
Um, I think this is a question since some of you are going to uh, private schools. Um, private medical schools provide financial aid and how do you manage the tuition and loans? And I just would, would just want to say one thing is private schools don't provide you with financial aid. It's called your tax dollars through government grants and loans and other things. So, um, so it's not that the, the private medical schools are providing any kind of financial aid. They, they may provide uh, scholarships and other tuition stuff, but uh, most of your education is paid through your um, tax dollars or your parents' tax dollars. But can you guys want to talk a little bit about that? Some of um, the... Yeah, I don't, I don't know, Jubin. Um... What happened was, you know, we submitted our, our FAFSA and CSS forms, and then the school for, for the way it works here is um, the school say, okay, you have, your family should pay this much money out of the total cost of attendance, and that's tuition plus everything else, the rent, books, whatever. Um, and they say, besides that, you know, you would normally have to take a loan for this, but we will give you this um in the form of scholarships, like you said, and and Cornell's done a really good job of fundraising so that they can replace everyone's what would be everyone's debt um, with that scholarship. And so um, I, 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 I'm not going to I can't be too specific, but Cornell has been very generous in my experience. And so, um, you know, I, I can't complain. <laughs> but that's also something you should be asking people at interviews, ask the students, ask the um, whoever the financial aid officer is that you're talking to. They often give presentations. Those are all things that you should be considering um, when you're going through each program. Um, yeah, I thought, the... uh, oh, oh, I'm go sorry. Ahead, go ahead. Um, so I think personally for me, um, I think, yeah, so school is really expensive, unfortunately. Um, certain schools provide scholarships certain uh, based on merit or by your financial circumstance. So I, that would be determined, you know, based on your application or your FAFSA. I think the other thing to consider is at least for BU, we have institution specific loans. So what's really nice about those loans is that um, you don't have interest rate until you start earning your first attending salary. So you don't have to, I mean, you, you know, you still have your loan, but the interest rate is really high. Um, especially for private loans. Um, so if you consider the fact that, you know, like you'd be able to pay it off in residency without having to pay that really high interest rate, I think looking into like inst institution specific loans is also a really good thing when you're inquiring about financial um, aid. And also if you get, in, if you get an offer from a school, it doesn't hurt to just reach out to the financial office of the school and say, Hey, you know, is there any way I could apply for more scholarships? Worst case, they say no. Best case, they say yes. Um, I know for my package, I asked them like about extra stuff and they were able to, you know, adjust within their, like whatever they could do. So why not just go for it? No. And another uh, important thing about applying broadly because once you get acceptance offer, you have to decide a certain date, uh, which is school that you're gonna decide to go with. Um, but then a lot of schools will give you financial packet before the date. So you'll have a lot of, if you have a couple of ex acceptance offers, you'll have those. And then each school will kind of give you the idea of how much money that they can like help you or how much money you're gonna be in debt per each semester. So you can compare each school and then you can pick the school that has the best financial packet. Uh, for me, Mount Sinai was the case. So um, that was a huge factor deciding, uh, me deciding that I need to go to Mount Sinai. So yeah, supply broadly, each school will give you a um, packet and you just like compare each other. Also, maybe Sungjae, maybe talk a little bit about like the military options, you know, is there like military assistance? Um, I, know, I know that is the case for some people. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, for military, so, you can apply for UCHUS, Uniformed uh, Services University, pretty much you know, they pay you to go to school. Um, so you get about four or $5,000 a month to yeah, go and, to and the Yeah, dean, and their Dean of Admission is speaking next week in our same oh, time. Oh, sweet. So, 
I'll, <laughs> I'll probably have the, you know, defer to the Dean of the UCIS. But yeah, it's just a great option. Or if you go to just a regular medical school, you can go for uh, HSP scholarship. So that like you get paid while you go to school, all tuition is paid for, and then you have to join the uh, military branch after you graduate and then do residency through the military and then have to serve a couple of years. But it's a good option as well if you're interested in, you know, joining the military and uh, having the financial benefit as well. Actually, on the I'm topic of- Oh, oh no, 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 keep going. <laughs> okay, oh. uh, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make this fast. Oh. Uh, on the topic- of uh, the military, one medical school in the Maryland area. I know they're like right next to the NIH, so their research opportunities are probably fantastic. And I have a friend from undergrad who goes there now, and I want to say that her she I want to say that it's basically a free medical school, but the the agreement is that you have to serve in the military once you're done with medical school as an army medic, essentially. And I know that depending on the field that you choose and all those things, like your chances of getting deployed will be different, but that is an option for people who are concerned about um, about, about paying for medical school. Cause I wanna say the tuition is much more friendly on the pocket there. I also wanna point out that MD PhDs do not have to pay for med school. And you get a salary. Yeah, that too. but I do live in New York city on a grad student salary. So just keep that in mind. So you're not living large. That's what she's trying to say. <laughs> she's getting by. Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add a point. So I not I don't have personal experience with getting the military scholarships. I've just heard through some people that I know. Um, one thing to consider is that there are certain specialties that the military will very heavily prefer you to apply into for residency. Um, like I for example, I don't think pediatrics is something that, oh, actually, I don't really know. But I, I do know for a fact there are some surgical subspecialties where they very try to steer you away from. And I don't know how binding it is when you sign their contracts about what fields you have to go into once you're in the military. Um, but I know that their match is a little bit different as well. So yes, financing your medical school is very important. But again, if you have an idea of what you want and that doesn't quite align with what the military program offers, I would be more, I would be aware that this limitation does exist and, you know, go into it knowing that, you know, you might have to reconsider some choices. That, that's absolutely right. Um, yeah, do your research, know what you're getting into uh, before you sign any contract with the military. Yeah. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, we had a, a Navy surgeon who went to regular medical school and did a regular residency, and now she's the chief of surgery at Camp Pendleton, so you could watch her video. She talks a lot about those things. Uh, the next question that came up was, what was the hardest part from transitioning uh, from undergrad to medical school? And was it how you expected or a lot harder or easier, potentially? Um, I'll go first. Actually, for me, um, it was not as bad as I thought, um, because in undergrad, I was under constant pressure and stress like oh I need to get an A I need to get like I need to go to med school if I don't get accepted to med school my life is going to be ruined you know I had that kind of mindset which is not healthy and I should not have been thinking like that and feeling like that but you know um, it was like I you know always felt like I had to be perfect I had to do all the you know extracurricular shadowing clinical and stuff like that to just go to med school so uh, if I get anything <laughs> below A then I'll get nervous and things like that. Um, but in med school, uh, depending on med school you go to, but um, a lot of med schools now have a pass or fail. So you just need to uh, pass each exam. Um, even if you fail, they do remediation. It's not the end of the world in med school. And um, you get to study a lot. I do study a lot, but it's not like I need to get, I'm not studying thinking that I, need to, I will get all the answers and questions right. You know, um, and uh, yeah, it's actually not as bad. And then we do, um, we don't have a final. So like a medical school, especially preclinical, it's all blocked. 
So you learn uh, one system two or three weeks, and then you take the exam on it, and then you, you can forget about it. And then you move, into the, move on to the next uh, system and stuff like that. So you don't need to like memorize and then um, you know, have to like relearn all this stuff for final. And we don't do that. Um, so it's a lot better. Um, I guess I can talk a little bit about it. I think med school for me was difficult because you have to figure out how to study. I think the individual concepts were much easier than, you know, o OCHEM. OCHEM is, you know, something that's just never going to make sense. But, you know, the concepts are pretty intuitive. The problem with medical school is the sheer amount of stuff that you have to know. Um, you know, they classically say it's like drinking out of a fire hose. And it truly feels that way. Um, so you have to learn how to study. You have to learn how to memorize everything. And, and you know, you, whatever technique that I used certainly did not help uh, for an undergrad, did not help in med school. And then as you transition into the clinical years, what made it harder was then um, having to study um, for the shelf exam for each rotation, but also having to like basically be on the wards from like you know really early in the morning to late afternoon sometimes in the evening and how do you have the time to study and also do full-time work in the wards um being a medical student there and so i think the struggling with that has been kind of um difficult and you slowly learn you know how to like compartmentalize your time and and, and you fit into that role a little better but it's, it's really a huge learning curve um at least in my experience Yeah, I do. Um, and I think, oh, <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No, this time you go first. <laughs> um, I think a big thing that a lot of people I have noticed is, so as pre-med students, we're all very type A. We want to know everything, get hundreds, and do really well. Um, as George said, it's an overwhelming amount of information. Each individual thing is not hard. For example, if I tell you that this bone in your body is called the fibula, that's not hard to conceptually understand. But then if I say, okay, memorize all the bones in your body in the next 30 minutes, that's hard in a different way. Um, and I think it, the way that I found was like basically one semester of undergrad work was like a week in medical school. So it's a lot of information. And I think for a lot of people, knowing how much to care is important. Like you have to obviously care enough to do well, but you just have to do well enough to pass. And that sounds really bad because, you know, we want to be very like well-read and, you know, like knowledgeable as doctors, but it's impossible for you to know like all the bones in the body in 30 minutes. So as you learn to understand how to prioritize how much to know, and then learn to let go, it's okay to not be perfect. And I think that's an important lesson to learn early so you don't burn out. Yeah, um, so for me, it was a little different because the education I had in undergrad was very, very different from med school. Um, my undergrad was entirely critical thinking, problem solving. At Caltech, most of our exams are open book, not that it helps. So getting to an environment where suddenly I had to memorize everything. I had to sort of rewire my brain, actually. I hadn't had to memorize things since like seventh grade. <laughs> but um, that's the, one of the nice things about preclinical being pass-fail. You can literally just focus on learning as much as you can and not worrying too much about your grades. Our school does this thing where they like to post the average grade for each quiz. I just didn't even look at that. I was just like, I don't care. I just want to make sure I'm passing. Um, I can't talk too much about clerkships because um, because I haven't done most of my clerkships yet, but when studying for things like shelf exams where you have an exam at the end of each clerkship, um, for that, I didn't have to worry about um, my grades as much simply because being in the hospital and seeing patients actually is the way you learn. And that stuff will stick in your head a lot better than anything you read in a textbook. So it was, med school for me was, I still don't think it was as hard as undergrad because undergrad was probably the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was definitely difficult because I had to change the way I was thinking, but it was bad. Like the difference for me was that in undergrad, 
when I was learning a new concept in computer science and in engineering, I could stare at said concept for three hour, three days even, and still not understand it. With medical school, I found that with medicine, if you give yourself enough time to learn the material, you can learn it. That's That was the difference. But at least, you know, talking about me um, and my experience, uh, I truly believe this. If someone like me can do it and get through it, like anybody can do it. So kind of have a little confidence that you will figure out how to do it um, when, when you get there and, and you will get there. Oh, and also, if you think you're bad at anatomy, everyone's bad at anatomy. It's a rite of passage. We all hate it. We all sucked at it. I think. I can't speak for the rest of you. George and I definitely did not like anatomy. <laughs> <laughs> we liked it because we got support. Um, and we had a yeah, fantastic... Actually, fun fact, that's how George and I became friends. We were both bad at anatomy and went to go get home. <laughs> so, so that's where we met. Yeah. I don't know. I, and just just a funny story. Uh, there were a couple of anatomy quizzes. We would have them, you know, every week. I would get like thirty percent, and it just you know, like the brachial plexus, just it doesn't it doesn't click no matter how many times. And 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 you know, Aaron, what you said about like enough is enough. Like at the end, my cumulative cumulative anatomy score was over sixty five, and I passed. And you know, I'm never gonna look at the brachial plexus ever again, like ever, unless you become a hand surgeon. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, actually, it was funny. I, I I went to a yoga class today and the yoga instructor goes, you know, our neck only has 14 muscles. And I was like, yeah, you think that until you have to learn them. <laughs> but like, yeah. So, yeah, sorry. The point of that whole thing was anatomy sucks. You're you're probably not going to do as great as you want to in it. And that's fine. No one is good at anatomy. That's all. Oh, the other thing is when you start rotating, Almost all attendings are like, oh, that's a detail I don't remember from medical school. So it's not, it's a universal experience and it's expected that you don't know everything. Um, some question, a question that came up was when you're writing your essays, would you say it's better to show you are open to different fields of medicine or show a specific interest in one, one or two particular fields? Um, I can go first. So for me, I don't know the best to answer is, but I can just talk from my own experiences. Um, I um, mentioned a specific field because I was uh, actually a medic in the army and I was in a uh, psych area. So um, I work with the uh, psych patients, especially, you know, uh, service members coming back from deployment with the PTSD. So I mentioned, you know, all like my patient interactions and um, my experiences as a psych medic. And then I wrote down that I want to become a psychiatrist. And I got a lot of positive uh, responses. So uh, I don't know um, other people's um, experiences, but that's for me. Yeah, but I also think that you have a lot of a lot more clinical experience than the average Joe. So you kind of have an idea, but uh, can you tell them when you have to decide that when you want to do something like what your specialty in medical school? Oh, did did I change my mind about specialty? No. When when do you get to, to select your specialty in medical school? Oh, so pretty much you have to um, select when you apply for residency at the end of third year. So you have three years in medical school to decide uh, what specialty you want to apply, and. Even if you don't, you can take a research year. And um, because I have some classmates that couldn't decide um, the end of um, third year, so they take research year. So they do more uh, clinical work and do research in the area that they think they might be interested in and then decide later. So, um, but normally you decide at the end of third year, you have three years in medical school to decide. <laughs> Um, what about you guys? Do you guys did you guys know what you want to do before, and are you still um, committed to what you thought? And then, what has changed, and what? Uh, I still have no idea what I want to do. Um, I don't think I don't remember them expecting you to have chosen a specialty, and that would not be a reasonable thing to expect because that's the whole point of medical school. 
And I would actually argue that if you have an idea of what you want your specialty to be before you go into med school that you haven't explored enough. So um, I think when I when I started, I was convinced that I wanted to either be a cancer surgeon or do ophthalmology. I've ruled out cancer surgery. <laughs> now I still am, I'm considering maybe like three or four different specialties at this point. So no, the, the short answer is no, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know what I really wanted to do in research either. Um, or rather, I knew I wanted to work in computational biology, but I didn't know which subfield of computational biology I wanted to do. So no, I, I think it's okay to be uncertain about that. I really also think the point of those essays, you know, is to really talk about why medicine, why being a doctor is your calling the the whole specialty thing that's really for you know four years later when you apply for residency but when you're writing these essays you know one thing that I think you should talk about is um what about you are you going to contribute to make um medicine a more diverse a more improved a more um well-rounded place um that serves you know as many people as you can everyone's going to say they want to help people everyone's going to say you know the things so differentiate yourself by talking about what specifically you're going to contribute and it can be from any part of your journey even like from your childhood um, but have that sort of uh, story that'll set you apart from everyone else who wants to um, help people because everyone was going to say they want to help people yeah actually um there was something that uh George I don't know if you remember this but um we had this one uh, doctor who taught us on our first day of med school how to stop the bleed. And he said something that really stuck with me. He said, um, you're a person first, a doctor second, and a specialist third. So he meant, first of all, like because you're first a person, you need to take care of yourself before you can take care of other people. But I think it also applies to this in that you as a person have your own experiences, your own background that will help you contribute something to medicine as a field. And then after that, like you are a doctor and you're still, your first priority sh still should be to take care of anyone and everyone. And then only beyond that, you're a specialist in a field that is more unique. So I totally forgot to about that, but that's great, great advice. <laughs> forgot about that. This is a question um, for uh, Sanjeev, because that one is, I've seen it a lot on, um boards and stuff uh chat message boards is that there's this recommendation that you should become a nurse first to gain clinical experience for medical school now somebody who became a nurse would you recommend that route um because that's what's been out there quite a bit and a lot of people come up with that as they say oh i was told by an advisor that i should first go to nursing school and become a nurse and see if i want to do this then go to medical school Oh yeah, um, I heard that before. I um, absolutely advise against that. <laughs> I uh, liked my experiences, education um, that I received in nursing school, but um, all in all, like if I wanted to become a doctor, I could have uh, gained experiences that would make me a good and better doctor in elsewhere as well. And um, yeah, I mean, like, but if somebody is already at nursing school or already a nurse and want to go to medical school and become a doctor, then I would say absolutely go for it. But um, I wouldn't say it would be beneficial for, you know, students to go for nursing first, because the way I see it is nursing and um, medicine are completely two different fields. And actually prereqs don't even overlap at all. There is a biology for nursing school, which don't count as a medical school. So that's another reason I, well, that's actually the reason that I have to get a second degree, bachelor degree in biology. So I have two degrees, nursing and biology, because after taking all the prereqs for medical school, I just take one or two more classes and just get another bachelor anyway, instead of a post bac certificate. So yeah, that's another reason I did it. So for me, um, yeah, so uh, I would say, you know, if your ultimate goal is becoming a doctor, then you should uh, prepare yourself and get experiences and extracurricular, uh, getting yourself ready for medical school. Yeah, because we had a orthopedic resident. She said that it basically it's a 10 year delay to go that route. And 10 year in her specialty, she figured out that she loses $5 million for, for that delay in her lifetime. So 
uh, it's quite a bit of money. So also just a little bit of general advice. Um, you should never approach anything because it's a it it's something you should do before doing this. You know, I think that's a huge disservice to you and also the patients. If you go into nursing because you want to be a doctor, but you think it's a stepping stone, you're not going to be the best nurse and you're not going to treat patients as well as you could as a nurse. Um, and so have what you want to do in your mind and 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 do things that'll get you there because that's where you want to be. If you don't want to be where you're at, um, you're not only hurting yourself, you're hurting your community. So really keep that in mind um, and, and have a laser focused vision. It's okay to explore different options, but um, don't don't half ass things. Um, you know, just because you think it'll 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 get you to a different place. Yeah, and actually, I know a nurse practitioner. He's been a nurse. He's been in nursing for thirty four years, and uh, the funny thing is, every single time any of us staff person get sick or out of bloody nose. Um, I actually wanted him to treat me over anybody else. So, I mean, you could have a rewarding career in nursing and go on to become a nurse practitioner or anything else like that, or just be a great nurse and becoming a nurse educator, or there's a lot of things you could do in nursing and there's nothing wrong with being a nurse um, if that's what you want to do. Um, and there's a lot of great quality nurses. I work with a lot of them and, uh, you know, I, if my life depended on it, I, I would want them working on me um, as much as anyone else. And so it's, it's a great profession. And like I said, um, nurses save doctors from making mistakes and, um, and they're as much as integral to the healthcare team um, as physicians are, because physicians can't do um, a lot without nurses. And, and so it's a, it's a team effort. So the person from the, you know, everybody's important in the team from the physician, from the attending to the resident, to the nurses, to the techs, to the person that mops the bloody floor between cases and stuff. So uh, everybody's important. So everybody plays that role. So being a nurse is not a down step is actually, and, you know, and you could, in, in California, you could be a nurse and live very comfortably. And I'm pretty sure in New York as well and other, other states. I also want to point out, by the way, that nurses, um, first of all, they're like the lifeblood of the hospital. It's genuinely impossible to do any sort of medicine without the nurses. They they do all the things that do doctors like put orders into a thing and they happen because of nurses. So first of all, like it's a very, very important profession and they do a lot of things that doctors don't even think about. Second of all, if you're going to go to nursing school, you might not actually want to go to medical school because first of all, it's a fraction of the cost. You don't have to take boards every 10 years you only work like most nurses have an amazing work schedule. They only work like three, three to four days a week. They get paid very nicely given that they spend a fact, fra they spend a fraction of the cost that med students do and they're unionized. So nursing is an amazing profession. Also something that will be very fulfilling and it'll, it, it's a great lifestyle. So like something to consider if maybe you want to be in medicine and maybe don't want to be a physician it's absolutely an amazing thing and it's a very lucrative profession so that's another reason why maybe going to nursing school for the purpose of going to med school is not a great idea because you might go to nursing school and then realize oh wait i don't want to be a doctor anymore so yeah yeah absolutely Um, was it a struggle to balance school, clinical ex experiences, and to have just like personal time to yourself uh, in med school and undergrad, I guess? And has that balance changed between the two? I can I can lead on this one. Um, you know, I, I really, my biggest regret in, at USC was killing myself so hard I never got the chance to do a lot of things I wanted to do. I had a whole bucket list of things I wanted to do before I graduated, and I didn't even get to the top 10. Um, you're going to work, you know, so many years as a doctor, and when, you know, you're at the end of your career, you're not going to wish you studied more. And 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 so I think part of it was, um, one of the things I learned in med school was life doesn't start after medical school. You're living life as you go through it. Um, and so I, with that realization, I forced myself to do, you know, to set limits on how much I'm doing studying, but also do other things. I started dating. I found, I met my, um, my girlfriend now who like, you know, 
has made my life infinitely better. Um, I, I looked into like different community efforts. I kept up the lobbying and the policy and, and working in Congress, doing a fellowship, um, doing research on projects that meant a lot to me. And I think, um, I think, you know, if you're able to kind of make time for it, you, you will start to be able to find a way to still fit in the studying. I, I think it's a, it's a learned skill for sure, but it takes practice and, and um, I'd rather have done it and gotten better at it than not do it at all and still spend 24 hours a day studying. Um, so during preclinical, uh, I think it will largely depend on the school you go to. It depends on how often the exams are. Cornell had exams every week. They were usually on Mondays. And so our weeks were a little flipped. People would study on the weekends and then <laughs> they would treat Monday and Tuesday as their actual weekends, so to speak. Um, I will admit that because, I mean, my PhD is computational. I basically have a nine to five. So my schedule now is sort of I'm taking all the time that I can to relax and do things that I would not have had time to do during med school right now so I've always really liked to dance and I've never had a chance to really learn how to dance so I joined a dance group during my PhD that I didn't really get to do during med school I mean partly because of COVID but also I just didn't really have time um I sleep a lot more now than I did in med school I will say during clerkships personal time is going to be very minimal. And George, correct me if I'm wrong about this. Um, also, everyone else on the panel, please also correct me if I'm wrong. But um, during third year, you're honestly just going to have to sort of grit your teeth and get through it. That said, it's also the part of med school that we all kind of came for. It's the part where you get to go into the hospital, see patients, actually practice medicine. So um, it'll be fulfilling in that sense. But third year is just something you sort of have to get through. So also, also, you don't do it alone. That's another thing I had to learn. Like, no one can do it alone. Having a community where that, whether it's friends, whether it's, whether it's mentors, whether it's, you know, having people outside of medicine to, to boost you up after a long day. Um, I think those are all things that you need in order to stay sane while you go through the medical curriculum. I think those are the things that keep you grounded um, and ultimately help you get through to the other side. Yeah, I could also add, um, I think, again, depends on what school you go to. Um, a lot of schools are transitioning to the 1.5 year model. So you have 1.5 years of preclinicals. And then I guess it would be 1.5 years of clinical clerkships. Um, I know for a lot of the preclinical years, um, in speaking with my friends who go to different schools, um, the general consensus is you have more time than you would think once you understand the art of under like how much do I need to know to pass and again I'm not promoting this mentality of like do the bare minimum to pass but I truly want everyone to understand that you don't have to be perfect and at some point you have to start prioritizing your health and your happiness and your enjoyment in life over being able to get a hundred percent on this exam and then like once I think people learn to accept that um, people have a lot more free time, especially because, um, I don't know about you guys on the panel, but for us, all of our classes were optional to go in person and people watch lectures at home. Um, and you can really do that remotely. Obviously we had some in-person components we had to be here for, but I, in speaking with the current M1s and M2s, they do have a lot more free time to, you know, enjoy with whoever their friends and their family. I'm sorry, third year is going to suck. There's no way to sugarcoat it. You'll have no free time. Um, you'll live in the hospital, basically. But as everyone said, we're all going through it together and it's like a communal experience. So it's not as bad as you think. And then fourth year is like the promised land. Once you submit residency apps in September, it basically like does not exist anymore. Like all the fourth years that I know are just like enjoying and partying and having a great time. I would argue I had more time, especially in preclinical, to to not study as much and to do other things. So, you know, definitely, definitely. Yeah, being pass fail also helps with that part. Yeah.
Uh, one person was asking, do you think that the type of undergrad institution you came from plays a role in admissions process? Like do youth schools versus state schools versus Ivy League play a uh, role in how, where you're gonna get accepted? Hmm. I don't know how to answer that because um, I only went to USC, which is a private school. I'm sure we can talk about our experiences. I think what matters is um, getting people to talk about you um, in a way that elevates you to wherever you're applying. I think that's really important. I think the story you put together in terms of your your overall holistic academic journey with your your GPA, your MCAT scores, um, your experiences, I think all of that is probably going to weigh a little more. Um, if you just looking at our my classmates, like there, you 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 get classmates from all of these lo locate all of these types of schools, small schools, public schools, private schools, Ivy League schools, and so I think I think what probably got such a, a diverse range of students in our cohort was that you know they all had um, you know various quality qualities that were irrespective of where they came from. Yeah, I think the bottom line is that from a lot of the themes that have spoken is it's important to do well wherever you are. Um, there's a thing about being a, the big fish in a small pond and being a small fish in a big pond. Um, and, you know, and, and I think uh, Michael Gladwell wrote this book called David and Goliath and talked a little bit about that is just doing well where you're at. I mean, you could go to Caltech and be a 2.0 student and if you go to Cal State uh, San Bernardino, right down the road and be a 4.0 student, I mean, I don't know. I think even though being at Caltech is a hard place, I think a 2.0 versus a 4.0 from San Bernardino, I think it's you're going to stand out, you know, if you do well wherever you are. Obviously, getting into Caltech is much more competitive, uh, you know, than Cal State San Bernardino. So, First of all, you know, being able to get into Caltech is much challenger out of high school than San Bernardino, but also doing well with the opportunities that you're given. Um, I think that's a really important thing. So, um, I don't know. I think for that, I, I think um, so. Yes, it's true that getting a really good GPA at maybe a school that's less well known will help you a lot. I actually do think that the school that you go to for undergrad does not it matters less than people think it does Medis, med, medical school is school blind um they basically care more about your gpa than where you went to school which is why uh, I, I said what i said earlier about choosing a very difficult school and choosing a very difficult major and deciding to pursue it anyway even though most people at caltech are actually not pre-med because they know that their gpas are not going to be high enough so i think where you go to school matters less than how well you do there also, just just to give a little bit of advice, like you can't really choose where you're at once you've enrolled. So focus on the things that you can control, you know, get those mentors who will like just say amazing things about you. If if you get really good letters of recommendation, I kid you not, when you're interviewing at all these places, they're going to say, wow, this person wrote you an amazing letter and they said these things about you. And those are things that really sway a panel to get you accepted or not. Um, focus on you know, doing the best you can on your, in your classes, the best you can on the MCAT, you know, I don't think there's a perfect applicant. We all have, you know, things that we didn't do as well in, but, you know, making that holistic, holistic application, everything that you can control on those as, as good as they can be. I think that's, that's a, you know, the way to go about it. I love I love what you said um, about like not being able to choose. I mean, you you are all you all of you are already an undergrad, right? So you're all doing fine. You're doing great. So just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that I would add too is that my organic chemistry teacher at a community college, um, basically one of his roommates in grad school when he was getting his PhD is now a dean of a medical school. So, I mean, and basically he said that he's, he's the person who's a dean now survived biochemistry because of my professor. So, um, so if that professor really like, you know, 
So I think, you know, and, and being able to make that connection. I mean, I remember my professors like, oh, yeah, you know, my friend's a dean. If you don't want to get in touch with him or have him come and speak to your group. And, you know, luckily I knew that person. I said, oh, yeah, I already know them and they've already spoken. So but that was uh, so that's kind of like, you know, how small that your world is um, being able to do well with whatever opportunities that you're given um, and your professors, you know, know people and being able to write about you and doing well, I think is important no matter where you are. And as George said, you know, you can't choose where you go to school. Like a lot of us don't have those options, certainly if you're first gen. Or for example, you know, Sangi, you know, he basically became a nurse and, you know, decided to get, you know, he's very limited to where he could have gone. And so, you know, and so, you know, you make the best of, you know, the, the best of where you are instead of comparing Yes, because you're always going to find someone who's smarter than you, who's um, who's more connected that, you know, but it's you have to live your life and, you know, stop comparing yourself with everyone else. Like you can't, you know, you can't. And and I think a lot of the pre-meds and I think and I joke with this with a lot of deans of admission that show up. I ask him, like, what's the secret sauce or what's like the and there is no, you know, just do do the best that you can be happy be well-rounded, be, um, take care of your own mental health and well-being and, and do the things that you're passionate about. Obviously, you know, we have, you know, four different people that were passionate about four different things and they're all, you know, doing the same thing and they're all in the same place. So, uh, there's no direct line. There's no shortcut. Um, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so for me, um, so I heard, so I went to community college and I heard before I applied, like, oh, having community college on transcripts is going to hurt you in, apply, in applying for medical school. So I was really worried about. And then um, my second degree was from Hunter College, which is not even ranked um, school. So it's like regionally ranked, or if you look up Hunter College, it's not like nationally ranked, like, you know, Ivy League schools and all the like top you know, state schools. So I was really worried about it, but I never had a problem personally. And all the friends that I had pre-med in pre-med program at Hunter all got accepted as far as I know. So school name value, I don't think it's gonna hurt you. Um, so. Yeah, also even I wanna say that the um, kind of this notion of there being name brand schools, it's not it's less true than you think for undergrad and it's also less true than you think for medical school like there are people that like there are people in my family who are the best doctors I know and they went to really small very not well-known schools in India and then there are people that I've met from Harvard who really seem to have no idea what they're talking about so I think whether like when you're applying for med school also please keep that in mind medicine is the same, no matter, it's going to be the same thing, no matter where you learn, most of your learning is going to actually be from your patients, not from the, not from your textbook, not even really from, from your professors, you're going to be learning medicine is learned at the bad side of the patient. So this kind of comes back to what George said earlier, apply broadly. And right now you are exactly, you're exactly where you need to be. You still can, and will get into med school doing exactly what you're doing. So, um, yeah, com I, I agree with what you said, uh, Jay, did I pronounce your name right? Yeah. Also, I noticed your AGS lanyard. I've been to that conference. Love it. <laughs> yes. Just to also, just one more thing, you know, really, wherever you go, you know, be proud of where you come from, you know, where, where you go to school, uh, be humble, you know, talk to everyone. Don't ever look down on anyone unless you're helping them up. That was something that the doctor I shouted for told me and that kind of really had an impact on me. Um, be genuine, uh, especially about wanting to learn when you're reaching out to people, you know, hi, I want to work with you because your work is this and I want to learn this, or this is what I want to get out of this experience ultimately, you know, as I apply to medical school. Um, and I, I really think things will fall into place if you approach the whole pre-med pathway with that mindset. Um, it's it's just so much healthier and, and you will be better for it because you're going to be um, able to be more genuine when you when people are asking you about your journey and that makes such a difference um a huge difference
Um, we have two more questions. Uh, let's get through with them. And uh, somebody was asking about where, where the location influenced your decision. Uh, they're interested in school in New York, uh, but it seems busy and, you know, busy. And, and so um, can you a little talk about that? Um, also, Aaron goes to Boston, so it's a, not as big as New York, but it's a pretty big city. I don't, I don't think you should, I mean, I definitely know kind of where you'd be interested in, but if you, if doctoring is really what you want to do, I think you should be, get comfortable with the idea that you might have to move anywhere to do it. Um, you know, I kind of anchored on Los Angeles. I graduated from USC. I was living there and I loved the community there. And when I didn't get an interview to USC, my own alma mater, didn't get an interview to UCLA, I was really heartbroken. And, and if I had been more open-minded, you know, I would have been able to be more productive about it. But, you know, all of my interviews for some reason ended up being in the Northeast. And I guess maybe I was a little more interesting to, to that group of schools. And, and you kind of go where it takes you. I think coming to New York, um, even though I it wasn't like at the top of my mind when I was applying was a great experience. And I'm glad to have had the experience because of it. You know, I got to have experiences I wouldn't have had otherwise. I got to live in a different place of a different culture. Um, and I think I'm I'm going to be more well-rounded, more, you know, having gone through so many different things I wouldn't have seen otherwise if I stayed, you know, where I was at home. Um, and, and so I think, I think that's, you know, having that mindset of, you know, I can go anywhere and being open-minded. I think that's kind of the best way to do that. Um, I think, I think New York, it starts to be like every other place you live when you're a med student, because you're always studying, but, um, you know, each place has its own unique aspects and, and you kind of learn more about that as you go through it. What about yeah. Preeti? You're from San Jose, right? So I am. <laughs> um, so you're yeah. on your way to San Jose to yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I'd also never left California or, okay, I mean, I'd gone on trips, but I'd never lived outside of California before I came to med school. I grew up in the Bay Area, went to school in the LA area. I was convinced also that I wanted to stay in California. I did apply everywhere. Um, I got, um, I got an interview at UCLA and at Stanford. And, um, so I was pretty hope, I was pretty hoping like that I would get a chance to stay in California ended up choosing Cornell because first of all, I realized after a while that I wanted to actually experience something different. And I, I'd never had an opportunity to live in New York City. I figured after this, I'm never going to get to live in New York City in my twenties. It's sort of like the perfect place to be. Um, and someone actually, I think in that question, it was also, I think it said, if, you, if you're on campus, maybe you don't notice how busy the city is. Uh, to whoever that person is, if you're in a school in New York City, New York City is your campus. Like the campus that you're going to be in is like five buildings that are all within two blocks of each other. That's your campus. And then your actual campus is the rest of the city. So yes, you are going to notice how busy the city is. Regardless of where you go to school, you'll probably be living near a hospital and you'll probably hear sirens at night that will wake you up. So don't worry, that experience is universal. And I would say if you are worried about looking I would say maybe hold off on when you're applying, but if you're deciding between two places and you can't pick, then maybe think about location and where you'd want to live. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Erin. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. No, I think um, that was a really good point where, um, like, starting to worry about the granularity of pros and cons of a program, I think is something that maybe can wait until you start comparing programs that you've been accepted to. Um, the other thing is like, you know, on paper, this place that you got into may not be your first choice, but you never know. Like the admissions committee picked you for a reason, probably because they thought you were a great fit for their community and you might really end up enjoying your time there. And I know that was the case for several of my friends. Um, and I guess the one thing to consider is if there is literally a city where you would be so upset that you got in this city for some whatever reason, then 
keeping in mind a prime broadly, don't apply to a program you would not go, you would rather not go to. So I think just finding the balance between realistic expectations and also keeping an open mind is important. Yeah. I will say, um, you know, no matter where you end up, I, like, I think, I, I truly think um, I came here, you know, I believe in God. So God sent me here for a reason, but, you know, the whoever the divine is. Um, there was, when I was uh, pivoting my research at USC um, to do language barrier research, um, my then professor said, oh, you have to read papers here. And um, it ended up being by Dr. Lisa Diamond, who is one of the um, physician leading researchers on language concordance, language barriers in medicine. Um, and I kid you not, when I got to Cornell, she was on faculty at Cornell, like just by instance, and this person who I had just been reading about and like idolizing in my undergrad years, I got to directly work with her um, as a Cornell med student um, without knowing she was there. Um, and, she, and she's now like one of my closest mentors. And so like, I think, you know, things work out um, and, and you go with the flow and it, 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 I think it'll make you a better person having, you know, the ability to live in a different place for a little bit. Um, uh, do you have anything to add to that, Mr. Park? Um, yeah, um, for, sorry, I was a little distracted driving. So we're talking about the location? Yep. Yes. Yeah, so um, I know like I, I heard what other panelists were saying and I agree with it, but for me, um, I guess I was, when I was applying, I was desperate and um, I had a mindset that I will go wherever I get accepted. <laughs> so I applied broadly and I really didn't care um, where the school was located. Um, so I was like, hey, because I really thought that like I was going to get either one acceptance offer or none at all. So I was like, OK, I don't care. I'll move wherever. I'll just get medical school done wherever I get accepted. Um, so yeah, I saw I applied broadly and um, so for me, the location didn't really matter. I just wanted to get MD degree and become a doctor. That was my priority. Um, so I was in a different mindset, but at the same time, you know, I'm glad that I, you know, stayed in New York City, which I, the city I like. Um, but yeah, um, so I, I guess it depends on the person. Uh, for me, I was willing to move wherever. <laughs> just want to get it done. Because I know a couple of my friends were um, taking extra year because they didn't get into medical school in the area where they wanted to, because they wanted to stay close to the family. Um, they wanted to you know, go to medical school where they grew up and have a lot of support system. I agree that is very important. But for me or some other people, um, they just want to because I was old, I was in the late 20s when I was applying, so I didn't want to waste another year, wait for another year, so I was willing to move wherever. Also, last last thought on this question, um, statistically, most people do not get into medical school their first time, and if that happens, like, it's not on you, it's not a reflection on, on you, um, you just pick yourself up, you dust yourself off, you figure out, you know, what could have been better executed, where can I improve, and you apply again. Um, and so I just want people to not get discouraged if that happens, because it's a, it happens these days. And, and ultimately, if it's what you want to do, it'll, at some point, it'll, it'll click. Yeah, absolutely. I also, um, just to add to that very minor point, um, it's much better to apply one year, not get in, and then apply the following year and get in somewhere that you're excited about than to apply to a bunch of places, get in somewhere you don't like, and then withdraw. They really don't like when you do that. So I like I think Aaron said it earlier, there is a balance between applying broadly and choosing places where you would actually want to be at. So just keep that in mind. But whenever when you get around to applying, that's something that you can think about. And it's very possible to find that balance. All right. So this is the last question. Um, th this person wants to know. Um, what challenges and failures gave you the greatest knowledge and advantage in your medical school journey? I would say probably life. And if each of you want to share that. Mm, yeah, I can, I can go first. Um, so 
I mentioned a little bit earlier about how um, my undergraduate studies, first of all, like I think doing computer science, which was and still is very, very challenging, kind of taught me how to think differently. Um, I find that when I've been learning medicine, I kind of like to learn it the same way I learned computer science. I like to learn things from the ground up. I like to learn things from first principles. And I think it helps me a lot with clinical reasoning in a way that I would not have been able to do without the way I was trained. Um, for example, um, like I said, I had a lot of trouble with memorization because I just wasn't used to it at all. And then the first exam that we had where we had to actually see a patient case and think through the symptoms and come up with diagnoses, that was where I was able to kind of put that algorithmic thinking to use really, really well. And um, like, it, it, and that was one example. Another was because I have a I have a strong ground in math. I also found that I was able to pick up reading EKGs very well in a way that maybe most other people weren't. So whatever strengths you have from like the <laughs> I can see George shaking his head because he hates EKGs. <laughs> but um yeah so that was one example. Um another thing that I think was very valuable to me for med school was during my gap year when I was working at Salesforce, I also spent a lot of time volunteering at a suicide hotline. And that I think taught me, it's a, it's an experience I would highly recommend to and all of the attendees, even the panelists, if you, if you guys would like, um, because I think talking to people who are going through that kind of pain and being there for them, supporting them, validating their emotions, it was something that was really helpful when I started, when I did my clerkships, I only, I've only done two of them, but the training that I got at the hotline was super, super helpful because first of all, like one thing you learn when you're at a place like that is to engage just the right amount that you're able to empathize and be helpful to the person you're talking to, but without getting too personally invested to the point where it'll hurt you. So I think learning that balance was really important. And also just learning how to listen actively and validate someone's emotions and not try to just solve their problems. Because in medicine, medicine is very complicated. It's much more complicated than even the best doctors in the world can truly, they can't solve every problem. And sometimes all you can do is just be there for your patient, provide emotional support. And the training that I had at the hotline was really, really helpful for that. And also, I mean, it was just such a fulfilling thing to do. And because my gap year was a very difficult year, I didn't, I was not liking my job as much as I thought I would. And I was applying to med school, which was very emotionally taxing. So being at the hotline and actually doing something for other people was sort of reminding me why I even wanted to do medicine in the first place. And so I would say, yeah, so the combination of computer science, like it, it changed how I think. And then the suicide hotline kind of changed how I would otherwise interact with patients. So I think those two experiences were the most valuable for me. Um, I'll just, I'll go next and then I'll be uh, just kind of give my two cents. I think for me, it was learning to listen to my heart um, and going with that gut feeling and also embracing failure overall, because failure happens many, many, many times. And so when I wasn't doing so well in biomedical engineering, ask myself, God, what is it that I really want to do? Um, and and dedicating that career in undergrad to Spanish um, God, it made me more passionate and made me more hungry, reaching out to like people who would teach me about sociolinguistics, how to apply it to medicine, um, looking into policy, because I was like, wow, this is really fulfilling. Um, when I failed cardiology in, in medical school and I had to repeat it, um, asking myself, okay, what's important, what's not? Um, I think I think the more you normalize fail failure with yourself the easier it is to learn how to pick yourself up and move forward. And the important part of life is figuring out how you um, navigate these um, navigate these setbacks. Um, and, I, and I think I think that mindset of okay, how do you cope with adversity so that you become a stronger person, a stronger doctor, a stronger, you know, whatever it is. Um, I think that was the most valuable thing I've learned. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, failing cardiology med medical school, having to uh, remediate that, that was quite the wake up call. Um, but, you know, it. I think I, I look back at it. Also, um, when, on your journey to become a doctor, a lot of people are going to tell you no. 
Pan, I think also one of my like failures, which I consider a failure, is interviewing at a place. Um, and the interviewer said, I don't think you should be a doctor. Um, and kind of taking that in stride and and you know, elucidating and and really telling myself, I, I think you're so wrong and 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 knowing why you do it, why do I wake up, why am I doing what you want to do and keeping that with you every step of the way, I think that'll um that'll that'll be the building block of you living a, a wonderful life. Um, I can go next. Um, I think one of the big challenges I faced was not finding mentors, but finding supportive mentors. Um, I think once you find a mentor, it's very easy to fall into this trap of they'll have my back, which is great. I, I really hope that you find supportive mentors like that. Um, it's very, very, very rare for that to happen. Um, so learning how, and I think these experiences have taught me really how to be more proactive. Um, and if something doesn't sound right, never say, you know, they, they must be, you know, they must be right because they are a doctor. They are some, if something doesn't feel right, you are a hundred percent in the right to say, Hey, I don't think that's right. And, you know, one of my med school, um, attendings told me like, you should collect mentors, like baseball cards, you know, like this one person isn't going to be your like, be all will 100% give you all of the answers you have. People have different ways, um, like different facets in their life. They can give you different advices about different things. So you should really just have a variety of sources. And if you know what one person said doesn't sit right with you, you are not obligated to continue that relationship. You can continue, um, you know, and you don't have to, you know, if you don't want to be aggressive, you don't have to say, I'm ending my relationship with you. But, you know, just like invest in building other relationships. So just really believe in yourself and never let anyone make you doubt yourself. Um, I really appreciate the, all the perspectives. They're all amazing. Um, for me, um, so when I started medical school, I was still in this like, uh, you know, <laughs> military soldier mode. So um, first year when we started medical school, we actually write our own um, oath so we don't do like for for Mount Sinai um, we don't do the you know the regular the, the oath and at, at the white coat ceremony we write our own oath and then we say it together and we actually write it together so for me my suggestion was oh like we're doctors you know uh, we'll it's it's our calling it's not our job like we'll sacrifice like you know even the death and stuff so I was still in the like a uh, hard military mode like oh self-sacrifice and you know like we're, we die for our patient and stuff like that and all the you know doctors are like I thought that they're gonna like my dedication and my willing to sacrifice but a lot of attendings uh, they were uh, supervising the meeting they're like you know what actually you know, you, you kind of have to be happy to help others. So throughout, and I, at first I was like, well, you know, it's all about calling, it's all about sacrifice. But then throughout the medical school, I mean, it's only like three years now, uh, but I think I started realizing that because, you know, um, I have to be, I have to function at, at my best level to help others as well. If I'm unhappy, if I'm tired, if I don't have any motivation, if I'm just doing just because I have to do the motion, then who am I going to help? You know, I'm not helping myself. I'm not helping others. So I think realizing that I have to um, take care of myself and my mental health and physical health to help others as a medical student, as a doctor, I think that's the biggest uh, lesson that I learned in medical school. All righty. Well, everyone, thank you for coming and joining us. I know that you guys are all at the, well, Aaron and George and Prince Madera in the Eastern and 
you're on the Western. And so thank you for joining us and uh, loved having you and hope that we could all have you guys return and uh, inspire us again. So thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And, 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 and thank you. I'm glad that you made it home safe while driving. Are you still driving? <laughs> yeah, I'm just sitting in front of the uh, Airbnb. That I... <laughs> All right. Very cool. Hey, thank Jubin, um, feel free to send my email to um, anyone. 